Um, you can see right here that there are three objections to Christ being born on December 25th. And the one that you hear the most, you hear it all the time, is that the Catholic Church was very crafty and they looked for a really popular Roman pagan feast and they said, well, let's just switch it out and we'll trick the pagans and they can continue to have their gift giving parties and all that, but we'll make it into the birth of Jesus. So is this accurate? Well, December 25th, they say, was chosen to replace the feast of Saturnalia, but this feast actually, the, it's, the, it's the winter solstice, right? When the days become uh, the shortest. The winter solstice actually falls on December 22nd. Now, it's true that the partying uh, for Saturnalia began December 17th and moved up to December 22nd, but the date just doesn't match up. It seems that if you wanted to pick a date to replace a pagan feast, you would have picked December 22nd. Also, if you watch that other video, or if you see my book, The Eternal City, I look at other research showing that there were church fathers, even popes, appealing to December 25th before all of this happened, way before uh, there would be the Catholic Church trying to impose itself uh, in a Constantinian era on Roman pagans. Now, the second one is that December 25th was chosen to replace the pagan holiday of the birth of the sun, the Natalis Solis Invicti, birthday of the unconquered sun. Okay, so the Emperor Aurelian introduced the cult of the unconquered sun in Latin, Sol Invictus. On your screen there, you'll see a picture of a coin, and you can see the Latin there. This is Sol Invictus. He introduced this in the year uh, 274, 274 AD. Now, most importantly, there's no historical record for a celebration of Sol Invictus on December 25th prior to the year 354. Why is this important? Well, 354 is after the Constantinian change. Constantine, as you know, in 313 allows Christianity to become legal. 325, Council of Nicaea. It's really only when we get to Julian the Apostate, who renounced Christianity and tried to bring the Roman Empire back into paganism, that we see this date chosen, December 25th. And even in 354, the date is simply designated as Invictus without mention of a birthday. The date only explicitly became the birthday of the unconquered son under the emperor, Julian the Apostate a man who hated Christianity, hated the Catholic Church, hated the Pope, wanted to turn the entire Roman Empire back to paganism and pagan philosophy. Why does this matter? Well, it shows that by this time, probably already there was a strong tradition of Christians celebrating the birthday of Christ on December 25th. Julian the Apostate knew this, and so he's actually doing a reversal. He's trying to get people back to worshiping pagan gods, in this case, the God of the sun, and trying to replace the Catholic Christian date of December 25th with a pagan one. Now, the third one is one that you hear all the time. I'm surprised that this myth is still around, and that is that Christ could not have been born in December since St. Luke describes shepherds herding in the neighboring fields at Bethlehem. They say shepherds do not herd sheep during the winter. More likely, they were herding their sheep in the spring, and that means that our Lord Jesus was born in the spring and not in winter. Here's the problem. Recall that Palestine, the Holy Land, is not in England or Russia or Alaska. Bethlehem itself is at the latitude of 31.7 degrees. So, as late as guys like Cornelius Alapide and other scholars, they're saying, look, you can go outside Rome on December 25th and you will find all the hills covered with sheep and with their shepherds. Okay, so that debunks the three major uh, objections against uh, the Catholic Church saying Christ was born on December 25th. How do we make a argument 
that Christ, in fact, was born on December 25th? Well, we have to go to the Gospel of St. Luke, and we have to do a little bit of math, and we focus first on John the Baptist, his birth, and details surrounding his father, who is Saint Zechariah or Saint Zachary. I'll refer to him as Saint Zachary. So, first off, we read in Luke 1, verse 5, that Saint Zachary served in the course of Abias. Now, there were 24 courses or 24 groups in the Jewish priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, because Aaron, the brother of Moses, had 24 grandsons. Each of those grandsons, for all the, the men who derived from those 24 grandsons, those priests were all divided into 24 units. And over time, over, you know, a thousand years, there's a lot, a lot of priests, a lot, a lot of great, 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 great grandsons. And so they're not priests 24-7. Uh, the priests, you know, they have jobs. They may have, be farmers. They may do carpentry or whatever, but twice a year, about, they their course would come up. So every 24 weeks, it would turn over. So one course would serve for a week, and then they would go home, and then another course would sign in for duty, and they would serve as priests and do the sacrifices and do the incense for a week. And then after that week, another course would come up. They'd go through the 24 courses, and then it would start all over again. This is how it happened in antiquity, all the way up into the time of Jesus Christ. So we learn that St. Zach Zachary is in the course of Abias. And the course of Abias served during the eighth week and the 32nd week of the annual cycle. There's some scholarly research by a guy named Freilieb who noted that during the destruction of Jerusalem, which was on the ninth day of the Jewish month of Ab, the course of Jojerib was on duty. So since we have that date and we know which course Jojerib was on that week, we can then go back in time, just following the backwards, the courses, and we can find out when each course would have been on duty all the way back for however far you want to go. And by using this calculation that Friedlieb put together, this means that we know without a doubt that the priestly course of Abias, which is the one that St. Zachary belonged to, the father of John the Baptist, we know that he was on duty during the second week of the Jewish month of Tishri, which is the very week of the Day of Atonement on the 10th of Tishri. In our calendar, the Day of Atonement is usually, it lands, because it's a lunar cycle, it lands between September 22nd and October 8th. So we know for a fact that this is when John the Baptist's father would have been serving on the temple that week. By the way, that week is, again, I'm going to give you about September 22nd to October 8th. Now, we read in Luke that when Zachary was in the temple, he had the vision of the angel, and he went home to his elderly wife, and they conceived a son in their old age. That son was John the Baptist. This means that if he finished up around September 22nd and he went home, that child would have been conceived around September 25th. Give him a day or two to get home, right? He and his wife have the nuptial embrace. They conceive a child about on September 25th. How long does it take for a woman to bear a child? Nine months. So move forward from September 22nd, 23rd, 24, 25, in that range, nine months. And where do you land? You land on late June, June 22nd, June 23rd, June 24, something like that. Well, the Catholic Church has always celebrated the liturgical birthday of John the Baptist when? June 24th, exactly nine months after when St. Zachary would have been on duty at the temple. This is historical fact. Now, you could say, well, Zachary and Elizabeth didn't conceive a child for maybe another three weeks or three months or however long, but it seems to me in the miraculous narrative of Luke that Zachary receives this, this vision, this message from the angel. He goes home, he conceives a child. So the child, John the Baptist, would have been conceived in late September. That means the child would have been born in late June. And the Catholic Church says, 
the birthday of John the Baptist is June 24th. Now, what's great about this is that the Proto-Evangelium of James, which is not scripture, it is apocryphal, um, it says that St. Zachary was in fact serving the Holy of Holies during the Day of Atonement, which matches up with what we figured out with Friedlieb's research. So maybe the proto-gospel of James is preserving a detail there. They didn't know about the research of Friedlieb way back in the you know, second century when this document was written, but it does preserve that detail, and it would confirm once again that John the Baptist was conceived in late September and that he was born in late June. All right, so how does this help us determine the birthday of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, in Luke's gospel, we learn that the Virgin Mary, the Blessed Mother, went to visit St. Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, when Elizabeth had already been pregnant for six months. This means that, and this is right after the Annunciation, so this means that the age difference between John the Baptist and our Lord Jesus Christ is six months. John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. We learn this from Luke chapter 1, verses 24 through 36. Okay, so if that's the case, all we have to do is add six months after the birthday of John the Baptist, and we'll get the birthday of Jesus. The birthday of John the Baptist is June 24th, or late June, based on the research we have and with Luke's gospel. Add six months, boom, you get December 24th, December 25th, late December. And this is why the early church fathers and the popes claimed that the birthday of Jesus was December 25th. They weren't trying to replace a pagan holiday. They weren't trying to deceive us on shepherds or winners or anything like that. They were calculating. And here's the really important thing. They were likely going on apostolic tradition. The Blessed Virgin Mary is immaculate. She's sinless. And you can ask any woman. You ask my wife, ask her own mother. They are keenly aware of all the details of each of their births. All the pain, all the suffering, all the excitement, all the joy of giving birth to a baby locks into the memory of the mother all the circumstances. And are you seriously going to tell us that the Blessed Virgin Mary didn't know when Jesus was born? And would the 12 apostles never ask Our Lady, hey, the incarnate word of God, when was he born? Or Luke, when he gets the details of the birth of Jesus, he's not going to know when that was. And the apostles aren't going to celebrate this liturgically? No. Mary knew when Christ was born, December 25th. She passed it on to the apostles, December 25th, who passed it on to the Catholic Church, December 25th. 